one miracle after another. The Pavel Goya story. The conclusion by the author Greg Bunn and an appeal by Pavel. Conclusion is perhaps an inappropriate word to use as an ending to the Pavel Goya story as his prayer experiences continue each day. Just as the preceding stories from Pavel's earlier years represent only a small portion of the miracles he experienced, it is impossible to detail all those that have followed. His intimate friendship with God allows him to live each day in an atmosphere of light and grace. Pavel's life continues to exemplify the promise in God's Word found in Hebrews 11.6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. One week after graduating from Andrews University, Pavel and Dana received a call from the Wisconsin Conference to serve as pastor. Feeling confident of God's leading, Pavel resumed his life of ministry in Wisconsin. He was called to a multi-church district, much like the one he left in Romania, and with many of the same challenges. By his teaching and example, he reminds his parishioners that problems find their solution in prayer. Several have followed his example and have discovered a life of miracles of their own. Pavel has a passion to encourage others to share his experiences in prayer. He has been a featured seminar speaker on several continents. At times, his seminars have begun with only a few hundred and then grown to thousands. DVD recordings of his presentations have circled the globe with life-changing results for those who have chosen to put the principles he teaches into practice. Miracles have been noted in every place God's people have genuinely humbled their hearts in prayer. Often, individual and corporate revivals have been the result. The words of promise Pavel heard his father read as a young boy in the churchyard continue to empower him. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. God's prophetic word is still being fulfilled. As an example of the miracles Pavel's congregation is presently experiencing while learning to walk by faith, a final testimony should be included. For years, the congregation Pavel was pastoring in Janesville, Wisconsin, had postponed building a new church. One impossible barrier after another had kept them from moving forward. As a result of many earnest seasons of prayer, the members were impressed to move forward in spite of the remaining challenges. They were a small congregation with very limited resources, but they proceeded step by step as the way opened before them. It was nearing Thanksgiving by the time the foundation and lower level were in place and ready for the large steel beams to be set as supports for the floor. Because of the long span from one side of the foundation to the other, very heavy beams were required to carry the load. Consequently, a large industrial crane would be needed to set the heavy beams. The building committee met and decided to have the beams delivered even though they lacked the $4,500 crane fee. Frank, a member of the building committee and also a welder, volunteered to bring his cutting torch to the building site to cut the beams to length after they were delivered. It was a big project, 
cutting the long row of heavy beams to length. Because of the thickness of the steel, the regulator pressure on the oxygen and acetylene cylinders had to be increased to make the cuts successfully. As the acetylene pressure gauge dropped to zero at the end of the last cut, the men were thankful there had been enough gas to finish the project. With the beams cut to length, they were ready for the crane to lift them into the concrete pockets along the foundation wall. Since all the members of the building committee were available on Thanksgiving Day, they decided to meet in the morning at the building site. After they discussed the problem of the crane fee for setting the beams, one of the building committee members decided to call Pastor Goya. After listening to the account of their impossible situation, Pavel asked, Have you prayed and given this problem to God? Of course we have, they assured him. You say you have prayed, but how have you prayed? If Elijah had prayed on Mount Carmel the way we pray today, he would still be waiting for rain. We have to pray in earnest for God's honor and glory. This is his church, and he is able to solve every problem we face. He has invited us to prove him, to see him at work. Let's pour out our hearts to God right now and watch what he will do, Pavel challenged. Realizing their pastor was right, the men formed a prayer circle at the building site. With earnest hearts, they began to pour out their need before God. When each of them had prayed, they didn't pause their petitions, but instead continued around the circle three or four times. The longer they prayed, the more faith and power surrounded their prayers. As they were praying, Lenny felt his cell phone begin to vibrate. Quickly, he reached for his phone. The curiosity of the group of waiting men grew as they listened to one side of the phone conversation and studied the joyful expression blossoming on Lenny's face. As he thanked the caller and said goodbye, all were eager to know the details of the call that had interrupted their prayer. Lenny turned to the others in excitement. That was the crane operator we contacted to set the beams. He said there wasn't any way he could reduce his fee for his crane, but he would like to do something special for us today. He reminded me of his request when he was here last spring for us to pray for his son's safety while he was in the army over in Iraq. Just this week, his son returned home safe and sound, so he's offering to come for free today. He said that since it's a holiday and he wouldn't be working anyway, he wouldn't be losing any money. He's on his way over here right now, Lenny explained jubilantly. Before moving from their prayer circle, the men offered their praise and thanksgiving to God for the miracle he had just worked for them. With thankful hearts, the men moved into action to prepare for the crane's soon arrival. Within a few minutes, the crane was on site and positioned to set the beams. In less than an hour from the time the men had begun praying, they watched the first beam lift from the ground and swing above the first set of pockets in the foundation. With men positioned on each side of the foundation wall, they guided the beam as the crane operator lowered it to its wall pocket. When the beam was lowered to the foundation, it was discovered that it was two inches longer than the opening. After a few measurements, it was apparent that the entire row of beams had been cut two inches longer than intended. They realized that this was more than just a slight delay, as Frank reminded them that the oxygen cylinder was just about empty when he had finished making the final cut a few days earlier. Since it was Thanksgiving Day, it would be impossible to replace the empty cylinders at the welding supply store. Frank called everyone he could think of to borrow gas cylinders, but without success. 
so the men faced a very sober reality. If the beams could not be cut to the correct length, they would have no choice but to abandon the project until another day. They couldn't believe God would have answered their prayers in such a wonderful way just moments earlier for no reason. Certainly, he would have impressed the crane operator to make such a generous donation just to have him return to his shop with the beams still waiting to be set. Once again, the members called to update Pavel with the problem of the empty cylinders. You need to pray earnestly again. Empty cylinders are not a problem for God. He is able to provide the oxygen and the acetylene as easily as you sent the crane you needed, he reminded them. With the crane operator looking on, the men gathered for prayer once again. After they finished praying, one of the men suggested they try lighting the torch, even though the gauges on the cylinders continued to register empty. Every eye was on Frank as he opened the valves on the torch. Frank reached eagerly for his striker to ignite the torch as the familiar hiss of escaping gas came from the tip of the torch. With the first spark, the torch burst into flame. Not knowing how long the flame would last, Frank quickly began to cut the first beam. When he was finished with the first beam, he moved to the next. Looking at the long line of beams waiting to be cut, the men held their breath hoping the miracle gas would continue to flow long enough to finish the project. Finally, Frank reached the last beam with the torch still working perfectly. The excited men watched the last piece of steel sever from the beam and drop to the ground. To their amazement, the flame extinguished at the exact moment the piece of molten steel separated from the beam. It was time for true Thanksgiving celebration. The creator of the elements in nature had just created the gas needed to continue the construction of his house of worship. While the beams were being set, it felt more like a praise and worship service than a construction site. Each of the men was eager to share the empty cylinder story with his family waiting at home. And it was clear that the crane operator would be telling the story at his home as well. Dumbfounded, he had never seen anything like this in his life. Every penny of his $4,500 donation was worth it just to watch God answer the prayers of this group of humble men desiring to advance his cause and honor his name. The church building project continues to move forward, although many additional challenges have come. Little by little, the members are learning that it makes a difference when we pray the way Elijah did on Mount Carmel. Although we have come to the end of this abbreviated account of the experiences of a sincere man of prayer, you will probably agree that a conclusion to Pavel's prayers and God's interventions is not forthcoming. For each new challenge, God continues to have a solution. For many, this will not be the conclusion, but the beginning. For those who are no longer satisfied with the mere reading of thrilling experiences in the life of another, this is an opportunity to begin a whole new life of prayer. Why wait? God is inviting you to begin your own intimate walk with Him right now. Friend, as you hold this book in your hand, you may be assured that Pavel has been praying for you. His deepest desire is not that you found his experiences with God enjoyable and stimulating, but rather that you have heard God's voice inviting you 
to step into the inner circle of His light and grace through prayer. Those responding to this special invitation may be assured that there awaits a fullness of joy, intimacy with God never before imagined. One day at a time, God continues to bless Pavel and his family. He has always been faithful to the promise that he made to him as a young man kneeling beside his bed. If you put me first, I will take care of you. If you were to ask Pavel the reason God has been able to work so many miracles on his behalf, he would be the first to tell you that it isn't because God prefers him above others. Perhaps besides Pavel's name in the register of heaven, it reads, because you prayed. What would happen if each of us joined Pavel on his knees. The end of the author's conclusion to one miracle after another, the Pavel Goya story by Greg Burke. And now, finally, in this remarkable story, we have Pavel's personal appeal to every listener to every reader of this marvelous book, One Miracle After Another. Have you ever asked yourself what plans God might have for you? In Jeremiah 29 verse 11, God says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God does have a plan for every single human being, and not just a general plan, but also plans for every day. Jesus would wake up early to pray, to find out God's plans for the day, and to receive strength to follow them constantly. David said in Psalms that before we are even born, God knows all our days. For sure, He knows our needs, our strengths and weaknesses, sins and victories. He knows our problems before we even have them. Moreover, He has a solution prepared as well. We pray and say, may your will be done. But do we know His will? Often. We pray and ask for forgiveness, for help in different situations, and for blessings. But how often do we ask Him for His presence and for His plans? In Romans 8.32, Paul says that if God gave us Jesus, how will He not also give us all things in Jesus? That is, all needed things in Jesus. When we have Jesus, when He is present and real in our lives, He has the power, the wisdom, the love, and the desire to give us all things, and all good things are truly in Him. But shouldn't we desire Him more than His gifts? God asked ancient Israel, to build a sanctuary so that he might dwell with them. Jesus came to be with us, and he was called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. John says that eternal life is to know him. In Psalm 63, David said that he wanted God's presence more than water, more than anything else. How different our lives could be if instead of trying so hard to fix our problems, to fulfill all our needs, we would rather try to know God, to experience Him on a daily basis, to have His real and constant presence, and then to trust our needs to Him 
and his leading. Again and again, we pray for his help. Then we try to do whatever we ask for ourselves instead of waiting upon the Lord. We try to find the solution instead of doing what he says and following his solution. Shouldn't we trust that it is better to let him take care of things than to try to take care of them ourselves? Mostly, all we pray for is ourselves and our needs, which places us at the center of our prayers and our lives instead of placing him in the center. When Israel sinned and Moses prayed for them, he didn't place Israel in the center, but rather God's name and glory. In effect, Moses told God, Yes, they have sinned and they deserve to die. But what are the nations going to say about you? Though they don't deserve it, please work for your name and for your glory. Paul the Apostle reflected the same attitude. What happens to me is not important. Whether I live or die doesn't matter. What matters is that I serve him, that he is the goal and the center of my life. Lord, do with me whatever is for your glory. The more we are concerned with ourselves, trying to solve things, get things, and overcome things, the more we lose. But when we are concerned with his glory and his plans, giving up ourselves, then his presence in our lives brings peace, growth, victory, and the best solutions for our daily needs. Jesus says that whosoever saves his life will lose it, and whosoever loses his life for him saves it. Remember, he says that whatever we ask God in his name, he will do it for us. He also says that if we have faith, the same as a mustard seed, we can do anything, and that we will do greater things than he did. Is Jesus exaggerating in these statements, or is there something wrong in our approach to prayer? Could it be that we don't really know how to pray, that we don't pray enough, or that we may have the wrong priorities in prayer? Could it be that we talk much about God, but don't really know him, and therefore experience his presence only sporadically in our lives? Could it be that we need him much more than the things we request from him? We cannot even imagine how great God's plans are for us. Our imagination is poor when it comes to his power and love. We pray for small things, things we can usually do ourselves, often not daring to pray or to think about great things, forgetting that he is the God of the impossible. Can it be that we limit God and his plans for us? God never changes. His power is unlimited and his love is infinite. He wants to live with us, to work for us, to bless us and to use us for his glory to fulfill the plans that he has for us. What if, before starting each day, we would seek him and his presence, ask for his plans for the day, and then make ourselves available? Can you envision what he can do in you and through you daily? The Bible says that if we seek him, with all our heart, we will find Him, and in Him we will find power, peace, salvation, answers, victory, and joy unlimited. And that may be just the beginning. This is the end of Pavel's appeal to every reader and to every listener of one miracle after another 
the Pavel Goya story.